Greetings folks, it's Professor Fiore, and today we're going to look at part one of C language variables. I've got Pellis C open right now, so the first thing we're going to do is start a project. Win64 console program. There's our pane over here for the program, and now we need source code. So I'm just going to create a little template. Okay, now in as a little comment. Variables in C. The first thing we're going to talk about is integers. Now these come in several flavors, if you will. We have characters. That's just care, C-H-A-R. These are one byte in size or 8 bits. We also have something called a short integer or just a short if you will. That's 2 bytes 16 bits. And we have a long integer or just a long for short. That's did you get that pun? 4 bytes 32 bits. And with the advent of 64-bit computing, we have something called a, a long, long, which is 8 bytes and 64 bits. These come in both unsigned and signed versions. By default, they are signed. So you don't have to say signed when you declare a variable. You just declare it and it's signed. So if you want it unsigned, you have to literally have to say unsigned. So some examples, if you're going to declare a variable. Um, I should probably mention that unlike some languages, let's say Python, you could uh, just sort of create a variable out of thin air, so to speak, whenever you want to. In C, you have to explicitly declare the variable before you use it and indicate, obviously, what kind of variable it is. Now, the naming convention is similar. In other words, it has to start with a letter, then it's any combination of letters, numerals, and underscores, as long as it's not a reserved word. All right? Uppercase, lowercase, you know, that's kind of up to you. Um, but as an example, character A, right? Semicolon. Remember, Semicolon is kind of like a period. It ends most lines. Not all lines, but most lines. Right? Single lines of, of action, if you will. All right. So that's a signed character. That's a signed 8-bit value. Now, if you wanted the unsigned version, you would just simply say unsigned character A. You can have more than one on a line. In other words, if I wanted a bunch of unsigned characters, I could say A, comma B, comma C, like this. I can also initialize them as part of the declaration. In other words, I can say um, I'm going to be declaring A, but I want to start it off at a value of 10. So initially it's going to be 10. Otherwise, you have no idea what's in it. It's just whatever's in memory at that instant. So it could be 0, it could be you know 12. Who knows what the heck it is? All right, continuing. Looking at the integers, I could say give me a... a short int. I could say give me an unsigned short int. Similar with the longs. You can also just say short or long. That's perfectly legal. You can just say long a. So it's going to give me a signed long, in other words, a 4 byte 32 bit variable called a. Right? So far, so good. Okay. 
Um, obviously, we can go to the long, long. I'll leave that for now. I think it's kind of obvious. Then there is something, and this trying to sometimes makes uh, beginners a little confused. There's something just called a vanilla int. All right, just plain old int. Not short int, not long int, not short, not long, just int. Um, and a plain old int is of actually a variable size. An int is a minimum of two bytes, 16 bits. Could be 32. It's essentially the most convenient or, or native size of the processor that you're using. That's what an int is. So it could be 16. It won't be 8. It's got to be at least 16. But it could be 32. So if you have a little 16-bit processor, ints are probably going to be 16 bits. Um, if it's a uh, you know larger processor, a 32-bit processor, then they're going to be uh, 32 bits. All right. I mean, theoretically, they could be 64 bits. Okay. So, given all this, we can declare some variables. We probably also want to do some manipulation with them. You know, add, subtract, multiply, divide, stuff like that. So basic math works like this. The order of precedence first is parentheses or function calls. All right, that comes first. Then comes multiplies and divides. So we use an asterisk and a front slash for that. And then comes additions and subtractions in that order. Notice there isn't an operator for power, in other words, for exponents. Some languages use a caret or a double asterisk or something like that. In C, there is a function, pow. So you would call that to get uh, you know, a square or a square root or you know, whatever it was you're interested in. So obviously, we're going to have to use the parentheses, right? Use the parentheses to order things. So if I want to divide, um, you know, a sum by another value, we're going to have to get parentheses around there. In other words, if you want to do the combination of A plus B, take that and then divide by C, you're going to have to write it like this. All right? Add them first, then divide by C, All right? The other thing is, like most languages, quote unquote, equations aren't really equations. They are expressions, they're assignments. So if I wanted to add A and B and get C, we have to write it like this. In other words, the thing we're assigning to has to be all by itself on the left-hand side of the equal sign. So I like to think of the equal sign, not as an equal sign, but when you see that, pronounce it as gets. In other words, C gets the value of A plus B. So what this will do is, you know, it'll go out to memory and fetch whatever the value of A is, then it'll fetch the value of B, add them together, take the result, and store it in memory location C. So in that regard, gets makes a lot of sense. Okay? All right, so let's just do a couple of real quickie examples over here. So I'm going to um, declare some characters. And I think I'm just going to initialize, well, I'll just initialize one of them, you know, just to keep things different. Notice the color coding that Pellis is doing. All right, so um, constants, as you can see, are sort of this magenta-ish color, you know, just like the pound includes or the sort of a maroonish. Um, these keywords like void and character and inner blue. The comments obviously are green. You know, it's good. It's a good visual, right? Sometimes you forget maybe a closing comment thing here or um, a semicolon, and, and suddenly the colors go crazy. And it's a nice visual to sort of say, hey, there's, there's a problem here. All right? Okay, so I'm going to set um, B. Oh, you know what? This will be more fun. Let's make this an unsigned character, or unsigned characters, excuse me. So um, B, I'm just going to set this to... Let's say 200. And C, by the way, doesn't care about these spaces. You know, sometimes I put spaces in here just to make things look a little prettier. C doesn't really care. As a matter of fact, you could do this. I definitely don't recommend it, but you could like make everything on one line. You know, sort of like this. 
C doesn't care. As a matter of fact, uh, the way the compiler works, it's going to compress all this down into nothing anyway. In other words, it's going to get rid of all the white space before it actually compiles it. But is that readable? Hell no. So let's, you know, have it look halfway decent. It'd be like having a book that has uh, no paragraphs, right? Everything just runs together. Ugh. All right, so a simple math computation here. And then we'll just print out the results. Get our old printf. All right, remember the printf, we had, that's where the standard IO came from. All right, we needed that. Now, I want to get a value out here. So here's the string literal that we're going to print. And the way C works is we have a format specifier. So in this case, I'm just going to say percent D, which stands for decimal, for you know integer decimal values. And then I simply put the variable that I want after the comma. So basically C is going to go in here. Now I can do several of these. In fact, I think I'll do a little trick. I can do this twice. C allows you to print out values in hex. Use a percent x instead of a percent d, and you'll get the value in hex. So I'm just going to print out c, the variable c in uh, decimal point, decimal version, excuse me, and in um, hex version. All right. So there's my whole program. Let's see if we can compile this. Well, first I'm going to save it. Let's give it a good name. My favorite name. Yes, I want to add it to my project. So let's build it. Ended successfully. Let's run it. All right, so it's 210 in decimal and D2 in hex. Great, looks good. All right, so we saw the values right, in hex and in decimal. That's pretty cool. Now, you might be wondering, why do we have all these sizes? That's really in a matter of, of memory efficiency. You have to remember that embedded controllers don't necessarily have a lot of memory. You might have a little controller that only has 16k bytes of memory. So if I have a lot of data, you know, there's no need to take up eight bytes for each one if I only need one byte, right? Um, this sometimes can bite you. I'm going to come back here and change my unsigned character A to 100, right? So A plus B should be 300. Hey, it's 44. What? How is it 44? Think about that for a sec. 100 plus 200 should be 300, but it says it's 44. Why? Because it only has one byte. It only has eight bits. What's the biggest number you can store in an eight bit container? 255 right? 2 to the 8th is 256. So you've got 256 possibilities from 0 to 255. So what ends up happening? Well, when you add 100 to 200, that top bit shifts out. It's gone. And you're only left with the other, other bits on the bottom. In this case, that works out to 44, right? 300 minus the 256 is 44. That's where the 44 comes in. So it's doing sort of a modulo. It's doing a mod 256 on this. Turns out that's actually kind of convenient sometimes, because when we do loops, you can actually use this to your advantage. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll look at that down the road, but suffice to say that it's not always a bad thing, right? You can actually make use of that. Okay. Get rid of this. Clean this up a little bit. Now I want to look at something else. Notice where I've declared these variables right, right at the beginning of main. So this is the normal place you do it. Um, these variables are known as auto class variables. That means they are created, in this case, at the very beginning of main. When main exits, they're destroyed. They only live in the context of this function. So if I have some other function and there's a variable in it, 
you can't get to it. In other words, um, I'll just create another Goofy. We'll call it Goofy. So if I have in here, uh, I'll just use another inside character. And I'll call it X, if I like it, a better name. And I'll just be kind of quick about this. A little contrived an example, but um, it doesn't do too much. So all it does is just set this value to two, and then it just prints it out, right? So if I come over here, I call Goofy. Yo, Goofy! Our program's going to enter in main and do our little computation. Uh, let's turn this back to the way it was originally, so we get our 210. And then it calls Goofy, which just comes up here, sets this x to two, prints this out. All right, let's just verify that, in fact, that's what it does. And sure enough, the answer is 210 in decimal. Two, that was the call from Goofy. Everything's great, All right? All right, now, there's no way I can get to X, this guy, in this piece of code over here, in this function. So this thing is created at the beginning of Goofy. When it exits Goofy, it's gone. It's history. So down here, it doesn't really exist, right? Over here in this position, it hasn't been created yet because we haven't called Goofy. And then when we come back from Goofy, in other words, if I tried to access it like here somewhere, I can't because it's already been destroyed. Ooh, that's interesting. It's good because that means I can actually have a variable in here called X, and this X is different from this X. So I don't have to have unique names for everything. In other words, this X is locally known within these open and closed braces, right? It was declared in this open brace, so it's known it lives until this close brace. Just like this A, B, and C, they're alive, if you will, between this brace and this brace. So, I don't have to worry about having unique names for everything. That's really good. But it does bring up a question. What if I have a variable and I need to have it known everywhere? A global variable. How do I do that? Or for that matter, if this thing is created on startup, right, um, and then destroyed, how can I have it so that it remembers what I left it off as? Well, that last thing is actually pretty easy to do. What you do is you include a new keyword called static. So what static does is the very first time you call this function, this value is initialized to two, on subsequent calls to Goofy, you know, I got a big programmer here who calls Goofy 27 times. It uses whatever the last value was. So it's not truly destroyed. It's known only in here. But whatever value it had when it left, that's the value it's going to have when you come back in the next time. All right. The other issue, having something globally known, what you do is you declare it outside the function. So I can have something over here. This x is not the same as this x. This x is known globally in this case. In other words, every place below it's been assigned, it's known. Unless it's overridden by a local. So this local variable x overrides this x. But if I came down here and said, um, we'll just cheat over here and get rid of the c and put an x, what actually gets printed? Well, I don't have a local variable here called x. It does, however, know this global x. So what should happen when we come into main, these variables, of course, are uh, we're not going to print them out now, but um, this print statement is going to use the x that's global. So this should print out the answer is 1 in decimal. Then we call goofy, comes up here, x is set to 2, right? Print x. Two, but X is not changed. These are two different X's. So that if I 
did it again, print it again, it's not going to print two, it's going to print the original one, because this X and this X are two different X's. All right. Now, if that bothers you, just remember, you could have two friends named Larry. There you go. All right, the answer is one in decimal. Two, that's the one from Goofy. The answer is one in decimal. That's this. Cool. Right? Generally speaking, we don't like to use globals. And if you can get away with it, you'd rather not have globals. Some people just think, well, I'll just make everything global. Right? Yeah, but you know, that can kind of work in small programs where you don't have a lot of variables, but you get a big program. Man, trying to keep track of all that is a royal pain. Here's a little trick that I do. Whenever I make a global so I know it's global, I'll prepend the name with a G. So whenever I see a variable somewhere in a computation, like if I saw this, I would know, oh, A is a global. It was declared out here somewhere. Okay? All right. So lots more to come on this. We have to look at floating point variables. See you then.